welcome to the fourth episode of the se- of season four of the Ubuntu UK season podcast. Season five of the Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that did, something seemed wrong there. Okay, um, it's Tuesday, the tenth of April of twenty twelve, and in this episode, we're going to talk to some of the people behind the UCubed event in Manchester, and to Jonathan Riddell about the future of Ubuntu. We will, of course, cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, and the latest from the Tomorrow's Technology Today archives. And if you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Laura, and with me this week are Mark. Hello. Alan. Hiya. And Tony. Good evening. So I've been up north and I went to another wedding, as usual. <laughs> Get you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's all about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, know, I don't normally get to say if I don't get in there first. Oh, okay. <laughs> How was the wedding? It was fine. Did huh? you hand out any Ubuntu CDs? No. It was a rubbish wedding then. Yeah. Well, that's all I wanted to say, really. So, Mark, Hello. what have you been up to? I've been watching Blake 7, the classic sci-fi series. I've da, never da, seen da, that. Da, 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 da. Well, nor had uh, I. Neither right. And um, a lot of sort of older sci-fi fans always go on about how good it was so i thought i'd get it off love film and see if they were right and is it yeah so far it's pretty good first episode was a bit odd but now it's sort of got into it it's it's quite good fun yeah. i once played blake in a spoof musical why does that not surprise me <laughs> why have you never mentioned this before <laughs> <laughs> would it have had an effect on your relationship perhaps <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. Um... my wig flew off <laughs> I can imagine it's quite an impressive week. Absolutely. So, Alan. Hello. What have you been up to? Oh, man. I got, I turned 40 last week. <gasps> yeah, I know. Wow. Yeah, I tried not to make too much of a big deal about it, telling everyone I wasn't really that fussed. It was just, you know, that I managed to circumnavigate the sun again. <laughs> I didn't really play much a part in that. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't an achievement. No, the earth was going that way anyway, and I happened to be on it. <laughs> Hitched a ride. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. But, yeah, I don't feel much different. A um, little older, a little wiser. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> Just a tiny bit older, no wiser A little greyer. No. <laughs> Any good yeah. presents? Uh, yeah, I got, a, I got a Kinect for Xbox. The you know the dance around your lounge yeah. thing. Oh, did you plug it in? It worked straight away. No, I plugged it in and it broke the Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> and I phoned up Microsoft and tried to get a re- uh, replacement, and they said no, it's out of warranty. Tough. Even though I remonstrated with a guy that I plugged one of their products into another one of their products, and the first product broke the second product, and they were like, nope, having none of it. They wanted seventy five quid to replace it, uh, to repair it. So wow, yeah, that, that kind of annoyed me. Yeah, not a good bestie from that point of view. No, I, the problem was I was on the phone. This was on my birthday morning. Oh. Right? And I'm, just, I'm on the phone to, to Microsoft and I was trying to lay it on thick to the guy and I said, this is the worst birthday ever. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter was in the room and she burst into tears. Oh, no. <laughs> thinking that I, I wasn't happy about everything everyone had done. Oh. I was like, no, 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 I didn't mean that. I was a little white lie I was telling the man. <laughs> Wow, and you didn't get your My Little Pony either. Nope. Uh, <laughs> so you're getting it fixed? Uh, I got a new one. Uh. <laughs> yeah, hey Technology's yeah. cheap and replaceable. It's under warranty. So, yeah. Tony, what have you been up to? Oh, what did I do? Oh, I went to an auction. Um, with, of? Of? Cybermen? Tat. Um, no, no, well, it was like a general auction. There was furniture and things. I went with uh, Amy Ferguson, of course. Yay! <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I think she brought a mirror. And Did you go mower. with Amy just so that you could crowbar her name into the show this week? Yes, yeah, she's been making some cupcakes or something yeah, for she, her Ubuntu segment. Yeah, she, she's trying to do some Ubuntu-based food, which is good because it's brown. Um, that's good, is it? Yeah. It's well, supposed to be purple food. now. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> orange. There's only so many aubergine uh, recipes you can do, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but yes, so we went to an auction. It was good fun. It was some real random bits of tat there. <laughs> Did you bid on anything? I didn't, know. I was very well behaved and very restrained. Um, but yes, it was good fun. Um, that's the end of the Amy Ferguson news. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we move on? Yes, let's get on with the show. Now, recently in the news, we've um, mentioned the Kubuntu project quite a bit. It's been uh, uh, a very um, 
prominently mentioned yes. <laughs> a lot uh, recently after some news that uh, it had been dropped and burned in a fire by Canonical uh, or something <laughs> like that. Anyway. Um, and uh, we wanted to get the uh, word on the street from our man on the inside. Uh, <laughs> see how many cliches, cliches you can grow up, Harry. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Riddell, and we've got him on the phone. Hello, Jonathan. How are you? Hello, I'm very good, thanks. Super, super. So there was some news a little while ago that uh, Canonical have dropped Kubuntu. What, is, what, what did that actually mean? It, it means that they won't be sponsoring the Kubuntu project anymore and that they won't be commercially supporting it. So you can't uh, pay them to be at the end of a phone line to answer all your questions and they, they won't be paying my salary and they won't be... Um, they wouldn't be shipping out thousand CDs, but then they would, they stopped doing shipping out a while ago anyway. Right, and for, and for end users, what did I mean? What did that really mean for end users? If they were already running Kubuntu, you know, eleven ten or whatever, and they upgraded to twelve oh four, would would they have noticed any difference? Well, no, there is no difference because that's the beauty of of the community made open source software is that we're um, made as part of the made by the community as part of the Ubuntu project and. Um, and so for the users, there won't be any difference at all. Unless they were, like, commercially, you know, paying for support agreements or something like that, that would come to an end. But your average right. end user with a, you know, laptop, desktop, they'd be fine. But I have a special announcement to make today. Oh, oh really? <laughs> Tell <laughs> us more, Jonathan. On the show. <laughs> well, we are today announcing a brand new sponsor for the Kubuntu project, who is Blue Systems, which is a nice German company who are sponsoring various KDE-related projects. Brilliant. Ah, this is good. And h- how did this come about? So, you know, th- there was obviously the news that Canonical were no longer sponsoring your employment and uh, and stuff. H- how did this move over to uh, become something with Blue Systems? Well, when I when I put out the announcement that, um, um, sorry guys, it's very sad, Canonical will be paying in more, but we'll carry on as a community project and so forth. Um, I started getting a bunch of emails from various companies and organizations and uh, individuals who say, ah, but we depend upon this, we, we use it, for, what can we do, how can we help, what's going on? Um, um, we, we use your stuff and we, if it disappears, then that means that we're in the poo as well. So um, fortunately, a number of them have, have made interesting inquiries that um, are are promising and uh, this particular one just wanted to just jump right in and uh, and sponsor us um, straight away so from from May then we'll we'll pick up the, their sponsorship so what does that mean in terms of um, how how things uh, get built and how the ISOs get distributed and you know how packages are made and you know generally the like day-to-day running of Kubuntu how does how does that change things it, it won't change because Ubuntu is a lovely community project and it's still uh, the core of it is still sponsored by Canonical, and as part of that project, there there is a there's a wiki page that lists what, what the Ubuntu project will supply to non-Canonical flavors, and those include um, the the packages in Launchpad and the bug tracks in Launchpad, and the ISOs that are built on Canonical servers and the the CD mirroring servers. So so none of that will change. So that that means Kubuntu really is just ends up being exactly the same as all the other derivatives like Lubuntu and Zubuntu. It's it's still built on canonical infrastructure. It's still using packages from the same archive. It's still mirrored around the world. It it pretty much stays the same. You just get your salary from a different company. Is that really? Right. So, uh, oh, yeah. so as far as end users are concerned, um, nothing, will, nothing will change. But I want to make the point that the word derivative is, is a bit... Derivative sounds sounds very deprecating of of the different flavors right. of Ubuntu, hmm. and the, and the release team has kind of decided that it should be changed to the word flavor. Yeah. Um, and oh, so okay. Ubuntu is just a flavor of Ubuntu, and Ubuntu Desktop will be a is a, obviously the flagship um, yes. flavor, and uh, and all the other ones are just flavors as well. And and the derivatives are distributions that are actually derived from the archive, but are are done out of the Ubuntu project. So things like Linux Mint and and Netrunner and so forth there. Their derivatives. So, how do you feel about the decision from Canonical not to continue to support Kubuntu? Obviously, you know personally, you've got, you've got a, a future employer lined up. But will it uh, harm the Kubuntu project in the long term, not being associated as closely with Canonical anymore? I can't see that it would 
over time the Kubuntu project since we we've um, managed to find shiny new sponsors and so um, it's all good and um, I understand fully that the Canonical needs to make money to continue to survive they, and they can't run into loss indefinitely and so they <laughs> they need to get rid of the, the loss making parts of their business and, and that's totally fair enough and, and so Kubuntu was one of them and the, the known platform was another one and um, they're, they're scaling down a few of their other operations in the hope that they're will make money on the bits that they're scaling up, which is things like cloud and and um, and, um, and arm support. Um, so that that's entirely reasonable and to be expected. So, is there going to be more pressure or, or less pressure to make Kubuntu a profitable project in the future? Oh, there, there'll be much less pressure because now it's um, we've agreed that Kubuntu will be a. a community-led, KDE-focused Ubuntu flavor. Um, so there, there won't be any immediate need to try and make it into a money spinner by any means. So most people will have heard of Kubuntu, and a lot of people will have seen KDE at some point, I imagine. Um, but for people who haven't um, ever used KDE or Kubuntu, for instance, could you give a brief overview of where Kubuntu came from and how long it's been going and what's different? Uh, well, KDE was the original community trying to make uh, shiny GUI software on, on the Linux platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, when when Mark was first assembling a team to make what would become Ubuntu, uh, the team said, well, we, we want to kind of focus on GNOME, but there will be a big demand for, for a KDE flavor of that as well. Yeah. Um, so they, they, they always planned for a KDE flavor of it. And... Uh, and I heard about this from, from talking to various people who were working with them, and so I, I wrote a blog saying, ooh, there's this top-secret project by this crazy African spaceman man who's going to <laughs> take over the world, and uh, Katie should be involved in that. And uh, so that was the top blog in, in Google search for Ubuntu Linux at the time of launch. So they also mm -hmm. noticed that, and they phoned me up and said, you want to help us do this this Katie flavor? So, uh, cool. So I did. And... It, it, with with it having a, a new commercial sponsor and possibly not having any of the pressures that you you might have had when you were working for Canonical, does this mean that you could perhaps take Kubuntu in new directions that you might not have done previously? And can you envisage what those might be? Um, we're moving out into the tablet area. <laughs> So we've just started making Kubuntu Active flavors using the uh, Plasma Active software from KDE. Mm -hmm. um, and we're moving into ARM errors as well. So I just recently got it working on my on my Panda board here and um, and a, a new developer board of some sort has arrived today. So I'm going to try and get it working there. So I think there's uh, those interesting new areas. But the, what, what we do in Kubuntu is simply ship what, what the KDE community provides us with. Um, so the other areas that the KDE community are moving into are, are the media center with Plasma Media Center, and that's been going on for a while now, but I think it's going to pick up more steam in the future. So I'm hopeful that a Plasma Media Center will turn up and, uh, and mobile stuff as well. As, as someone who's never used um, Plasma Active and has seen... Um the blog posts about the upcoming uh, tablet from Aaron Saigo, the um, Vivaldi. Um, what what sets um, Plasma Active apart from the desktop flavor of KDE? What what makes it a tablet oriented operating system? Oh, it's entirely in the user interface. Um, so of course, uh, KDE software is based on the Qt uh, widget toolkit and Qt recently, and is a technology called Qt Quick using a nice language called QML or QML, mm -hmm. and that is entirely designed for the kind of friendly touch um, interfaces. Um, then you get used to it when you're using the, the smartphones and tablet devices and so forth. So the Plasma Active project and the, the rest of the Active projects within KDE is designing new interfaces onto the same bits of software that have more swishy, fancy effects that are more touch-friendly. And uh, QML is really, um, is really key to making that happen, and it makes it so, so easy to make that kind of user interface. So 
so it's like Canonical is also picking up the technology and all those stuff they're working with. That's all done with QML as well. So under the covers of Plasma Active, you might you might still have K Write or um, whatever the new I can't remember what uh, K Office is now called. Caligra. Uh, Caligra. Well, well, Caligra will have still the normal desktop version, but they also have an active version, right. version right. as well with slightly different user interfaces onto the same the same core widgets. So they, it still renders Microsoft Office files and all the difficult stuff, uh, but the user interface is, is very touch friendly. So does that create a lot more of a sort of um, uh, sort of resource requirement in terms of development resources for you know, you've now got if you're uh, maintaining an application you've now got to produce two different interfaces for it or is there sort of clever stuff that makes it a lot easier for people to do? It will add a little bit more to the to the developer resources. It's only more effort to maintain two than to maintain one. Hmm. Um, but I think what will happen longer term is that the the QML interfaces will be adapted so that they can work and fit in to uh, the desktop environment. Right. That seems yeah. to be the trend in user interfaces is that all the new stuff that's coming through from tablets and mobile interfaces, those new concepts are being added into desktops. So I think, yeah. I think that's the way it will go. Hmm. Cool. One of the... the criticism leveled at modern um, desktop user interfaces and I know Unity, GNOME and KDE have all had beaten with this stick is the one of performance and you know bloatedness and uh, and that kind of thing um, on a tablet you've got a generally a, a lower set of resources than you have on a modern desktop or laptop PC how, how does Plasma um, perform on one of these devices that have you know typically one or two cores of a one gigahertz ARM CPU. How how does it actually perform? Is it does it feel good or is it like yeah. an old Chinese tablet? No, <laughs> it, it feels very good, and uh, and the reason for that is is it comes back to the Qt technology as well, because Qt are owned by Nokia. Now they are obviously focused on making sure that Qt works very very well on low end um, telephone type devices that Nokia make. Uh, so they're and so when they were designing the, the QML technology, they made sure that it was very, very um, performant on on the kind of mobile phone software right. and hardware platforms. And that's why uh, I believe Ubuntu uses Unity now and why there are, there are two versions of that, one using kind of known technologies, but because they weren't very good enough to run on ARM computers and the like, they had to uh, rewrite it in, in Qt and QML. Right, the Unity 2D. Yes, Unity 2D. But Unity 2D, because it's written in Qt, it works very, very well on unaccelerated, but it also works very well on accelerated hardware. So um, it, it's a bit of a deprecating name because it actually works on great on all machines from the, <laughs> the most lowest power to the highest power of machines. Right. We've got some questions coming in in our IRC channel uh, who people who are listening live to the interview. Um, Dee Shimmer would like to ask what the prime audience for Kubuntu is. Um, is it mostly people who just like K- KDE um, or are there companies involved? You mentioned about companies getting in contact with you. Mm, I haven't done in that much um, user profiling um, that I would give a, be able to give a, a terribly sick answer, but I can tell you that it, our, the core audience that I started off for was the KDE fanboy audience, people who um, love the, the KDE software and want a distribution that brings that KDE software out in the best light. But it, um, it's also used in, for example, the world's biggest Linux desktop rollout, which is 100,000 schools in Brazil that all run it. And I've, I've been to various other places across the world, like um, the Canary Islands. They, they run it on all their university and school uh, platforms and uh, it's run by the French government and, and is in the French assembly so all the politicians there love it and uh, so there's a bunch of really big and important roles like that as well so I think the, the tactics of aiming at KD fanboys works really well when uh, the KD fanboys turn into the um, people in charge of rolling out great big <laughs> they turn into the swans <laughs> <laughs> thanks Tony <laughs> brilliant um, I think uh, that's covered all of our questions uh, right now. Um, where can people learn out more, learn more about Kubuntu, and uh, uh, maybe get uh, hold of Plasma Active and this kind of stuff? Uh, we have the usual 
ways. We, we have a website, we have wiki pages, we have IRC, hash Ubuntu, and uh, we have a bunch of forums. And uh, Plasma Active is still in development, so you can download that as part of the beta, uh, the 12.04 beta, and you can get that from the kubuntu.org website. Lovely. Cool. Well, it's been lovely talking to you, uh, Jonathan, and I'm glad that yeah. uh, things have worked out both for Kubuntu and for you personally. And I um, uh, hope to speak to you maybe uh, in the future when we've uh, we've seen releases under the new stewardship. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. I'll be at all the Ubuntu summits in the future, so I'll be seeing plenty more of you. Excellent. Cool. Excellent. Oh. Cheers, Jonathan. Cheers. Cheers. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And now it's time for the news. And the Creative Commons project has announced the first public draft of version 4.0 of its licenses. The new suite of licenses include provisions to cover areas such as database rights, which are not covered by copyright. The draft is available on the Creative Commons wiki, along with the page for discussion and comments. Good. Excellent. Licensing news is fun. <laughs> <laughs> is it going to be backwards compatible? Are you going to read it backwards? <laughs> no, you fool. You know how usually it's, um, you know, you have like the GPL version 2 or higher. Oh, yes. That kind of stuff. Automatic increments. Mm. But, I don't uh, know. Yeah. I'll have to look into it. Well, it, it's, mm. you I mean, what does, I've never read the legal text of a Creative <laughs> Commons license. Strange oh, as I, it I, just, I just use I the wizard. Yeah. Yeah, I usually do as well. What's, yeah. what's yeah. his name? It's good that it's still uh, under development and uh, it's not, yes. uh, you know, just withering on the vine. It's good. In an effort to simplify maintenance between the two projects, UDev and System D, they have merged. The move will allow features such as hot plug device support in the Linux init daemon and will reduce code duplication. In it. In it. <laughs> oh dear. It will. Yes. yes. That's the only joke I have about that news item. <laughs> <laughs> in it yeah, good? It, it caused it, well, it caused a bit of like, you know, potential controversy, but actually there is none. Things will just probably carry on as they are and um, yeah, people can either use System D or not, and still use UDev. Good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's good to be able to plug things into a computer. <laughs> and have <laughs> that them work. Oh, bless you, Tony. Bless you. <laughs> yeah, without having to mount them manually. Oh, and more licensing news for those of you still struggling to get over the previous news article. The OpenStreetMap <laughs> Foundation has started Yay. work on a tool to remove any map data that is not compatible with the new Open Database license that the project is moving to. The tool is currently subject to extensive testing and the Foundation have invited developers to help fix outstanding bugs. Now, I've actually read the article that this is based on, um, <laughs> and it seems to be trying to go through all of their data sets to remove things that aren't licensed correctly. Um, now, quite why, if the metadata exists to tell them what it's licensed under, quite why it's not that trivial. No, to get no it's because they, it's people made contributions under different licenses. <laughs> yes. And they're changing the license. They want to change the license of everything, so they've had to get all of the people who have contributed to say, yes, I'm happy to relicense it. And then now they've got to go through and remove all the bits from the people who haven't said yes. Yeah, it seems like it should be a SQL query to do that. Why don't you uh, get on the get on the OpenStreetMap wiki? In, uh, See, this is an interesting way to do it. That when when Canonical relicensed the um, Ubuntu wiki, um, they put out loads of um, blog posts and uh, emailed as as best as they could everyone who'd ever contributed to the wiki. Now they couldn't quite get hold of everyone because some people have deleted their accounts or changed their email addresses or whatever. But they they just said we're relicensing the whole wiki. But they, and they asked for comments, but they didn't actually go through and delete all the edits that were done by individuals who, who, who complained yeah. or, or said, I don't want that license change. Well, presumably it's the kind of no news is good news thing. If somebody actively complains, they do something about it. But if they don't raise their hand about it, then it just kind of goes over. You plus don't have the, to have a tool. Plus the good thing is it was actually being made a more permissive license. So it was actually <laughs> going in the right direction. Rather. Yeah. Mm. Well, there we go. Mark's got some news. I have some billion news. Ooh. Bilious news. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Red Hat is now a billion dollar company, making it the first Linux company to reach that size. Ooh. Ooh. In more billion news, Microsoft has acquired a large number of patents from AOL for one billion dollars, including IP relating to Netscape. Uh. Ooh. Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg. 
has announced a one billion pound scheme to create jobs and work experience places for under twenty five years old. How is this related to a billion news? Oh, billion news. Sorry. I think they just did a search. Shh. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> Facebook has acquired Instagram, the weird photo sharing site, for one billion dollars. Mm, it shares. It shares a billion photos of people's feet. Yeah. In <laughs> very, nice, shiny yeah, very way. fancy sepia tones, square. Sepia yeah. tones, sort of like an old Polaroid. With chrome. And that's the end of the news. And the billion news. We have events. We do. It's one in much. particular. Um, yes, there is one event this year. <laughs> there are no others. <laughs> Forget all the others that you may hear about later on. This one event is called Og Camp. I have heard of it. Yes. <laughs> Tell me more. Well, Og Camp is happening in Liverpool on the... I've heard of that as well. <laughs> uh, it is oh, yeah, that's from not in the, the notes. S- uh, 18th, 18th and 19th. to the 19th. It is, yes, the 18th and the 19th of August. That's Saturday the 18th and Sunday the 19th. Yeah, I'm just skipping forward in my calendar. That is right. Um, And uh, we have some additional news. We have an official hotel. Usually we don't have an official hotel. We just then recommend a few hotels. But this time we've got an official hotel and um, we've got a a special room rate with them. Um, And the good news about this hotel, which is the Britannia Adelphi City Centre Hotel in Liverpool, it's Five minutes walk, literally five minutes walk from Lime Street sta- train station and also five minutes walk from the venue. So you can stand in one place and basically see everything in a single frame. You can see all of Liverpool. From, <laughs> from all, the, all uh, of Liverpool that matters. <laughs> from the, yes, the train station to get you out of Liverpool and the... <laughs> and in. <laughs> and, well, yes, and in in the first place. I and understand the, the, the hotel is also noted for its height. Yes, apparently it has high ceilings, so I'm told by a friend who stayed there yes, once. It's not, that it, was the extent of the review. Yes. <laughs> it's not your uh, your new style, um, modern uh, hotel. It's uh, It's got is character. It, is it one of those ones where there's ten of you have to share a bathroom at the end of the corridor? <laughs> it's not, not like no. that, no. Oh, okay. it's, uh, it's a good venue. And the detail you need is if you want to come along to uh, Ogg Camp in August, uh, 18th and 19th this year, uh, you need to phone them up. That's the easiest way because the website is rubbish. <laughs> and the booking reference, in fact, don't even use the booking reference. Just say Og Camp. Yeah. In tell, August. Tell them, tell them you want to book a room in August and it's for an event called Og Camp. They'll, um, they'll get it. Yes. Uh, you want to, right, we'll give you the number. Do we have a jingle for this? No. It's 0151 709 7200. Nicely sung there. In quotes. You didn't watch Children's BBC at all. That's 0151 709 7200 and ask for Jackie Carter. And she may or may not be there. No. Um, so the, the room rate for the. This is just sounds in a classy is, enterprise. It is. Isn't it? If she's on a tea break, you have to call back in 10 minutes. <laughs> she might call you back. This is a proper community event. Um, it's £35 per person per night based on two people sharing a twin or double. Uh, single rooms are also available at 60 per person per night. Payment on arrival. Yes. We'll put all of that on the website so you can just skip this bit when you're listening. But basically, Og Camp's really happening. There's and a there's hotel a, and yeah. you're pretty safe to book a room. And if you, yes. if you, the cool thing about us having an official hotel is we're all going to be there. So if you yes. want to meet up with people from the community and come and buy us beer for putting on such a great event, <laughs> you're just trying that's now, where you're you? going to find us. And even if you're staying in another hotel, if you want to know where everyone's going to be, come there and meet us in the bar and whatever. So where can people get tickets for Old Camp itself? Uh, that's going to follow in a later update. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so get your hotel book now and then hopefully you'll be able to get into the event later. It'll be fine. <laughs> Excellent. Right, that's the end of the events. And welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners wherever you are around the British Empire. In today's look at Tomorrow's Technology Today, which we recorded yesterday, we'll be telling you about all sorts of technology you can expect tomorrow, or the day after that. Straight on to business, let's welcome our doyen of the domestic, Deirdre Morris Oxford. Hello, Deirdre. Hello, Douglas. So, Deirdre, 
what spectacle of tomorrow's technology today have you for us today? Well, Douglas, today I'm actually talking to you from the world of work. The world of work, Deirdre? Why, whatever would a pretty young thing like you be thinking about work? It's more productive than your drunken philandering, Douglas. That's not in the script, Deirdre. I know. So, what's coming to the world of work in the future, Deirdre? It seems the Office of the Future will be run by one man operating the whole place using a set of automated levers and pedals. But surely that means an economy of full employment will be a thing of the past. Yes, Douglas, but there are some people who think that employment is overrated, like your brother, Rafe. There's no need to mention my family, Deirdre. So the one-man office, eh? We asked the common man in the street what he thinks. Begging your pardon, Gov. I shouldn't like to think too much for myself in case I contradict what the elders and betters in charge of the British Empire have decided what's best for me. Oi, get out the middle of the road, you. Uh, uh. Well... That's one less common man to stand outside the Labour Exchange. He should have stayed on the Clapham Omnibus, Douglas. He certainly should, Deirdre. Well, that's all from tomorrow's technology today. A total pip and God save the King. Now we have Les and Tony from UCube. How are you doing, gents? Very well, thank you. Good, good. Um, so tell us a little bit about UCube. Well, UCube is basically an open source unconference in Manchester. It's totally free of charge and it's there to promote the use of Linux in general. Now, it, ideally, it's Debian based distros we look at, such as CrunchBang, Ubuntu, uh, Linux Mint, that sort of thing. But any and all are welcome. If they want to come along and talk about any uh, Red Hat products or uh, SUSE Linux, they're quite welcome to. Even Android is on the, the card this year. Is this, is this the second one you've done? or Third. Third? Oh, wow. So when, yeah. how did the last ones go? Really well, the last one. Uh, we're completely chock-a-block in Mad Lab. It's, it's not a massive venue, but we filled it. Um, there's workshops during the day, which um, Tony was running. He was doing the demo area. And we had an upstairs classroom, which we were using for general talks and workshops, um, <coughs> such as, well, building a home server, uh, talking about the use of Unity in, in the distros and that sort of thing. Not Unity in Avanti's Unity, but oh. Unity between all the distros. <laughs> ah, Unity see what, small you. See, see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's all organised proper on conference style, so people sign up on the day. Yeah, it's proper things. on conference. <laughs> it's a complete blank piece of paper on the wall and we say, fill it. I go, I go to the pub and that's it. <laughs> that's the best way. No, the butty shop. <laughs> oh, yeah, the butty shop, yeah. Right. So last year, if I remember rightly, last year it was it was mostly Ubuntu related and this year it's kind of diversified to um, become like Debian-based kind of thing. Um, what, what's the rationale behind... Um, spreading out to other distros and what how, how is that going to work out can i can i come in on that um, Go for it. correct me if i'm wrong les but my understanding is it's always been about uh upstream and downstream from ubuntu ah. you know the debian base and uh ubuntu derivatives so you're getting the whole remit which is why we include crunchbang linux mint Obviously, Ubuntu is the focus, but then you've got Debian as the as the kind of mother distri distribution. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the first UQ we did in oh, 2010, now August 2010, it was purely Ubuntu, really. Um, it was based around the, the Global Jam, just before the, the beta release came out. Right. And the purpose then was to really just do a bit of beta testing and talk about Ubuntu as it was in the day. For the second one, we, we sort of thought about well, we can expand upon this and, and change what the day's all about. Yes, there's still going to be bug testing, there's going to be beta testing, there's trying out different distros. <clears throat> but 
there is also the fact that you can do anything there because it's, it's, it's free and open source software. We're not bothered about if it's Ubuntu or Debian based. If you want to talk about using WordPress on your blog, you can do that. I mean, one of the hits from last year was uh, Mike Rimmikin's Heed and uh, Aaron and uh, GNU Doc, which is Ajav, who's one of the, the helpers at this year's Og Camp. They were doing a workshop ad hoc about how to do web development using Ubuntu. And the person they were doing the talk to knew nothing about Ubuntu, but they were a web developer who had been using Windows and Macs all their career. And they sat there all day listening to these guys showing them what tools they can use for free and just go off and do their job. That's awesome. Well, I installed a laptop with Ubuntu, by the way, or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> so they even got to take away a working environment at the end of it. Oh, yeah, definitely. We've, we've got all the kit at Mad Lab for people to come in with their laptops, say, I want Ubuntu on that, and we can stick it on them. Or if they say, I want Debian, we can stick it on. Linux Mint, anything, we'll stick it on. <laughs> cool. So all the sessions are very hands-on and how-to focused rather than just straightforward talks? Well, it's, as an on-conference is, anyone can do whatever they want. Mm. So they can, if someone wants to come in and do a hands-on session, they can. I mean, this year, I'm currently speaking to Alan O'Donoghue, who did Hack to the Future, to see if he can do a, a lesson on beginning uh, programming with Python. Mm. And that's going to run pretty much all day. So anyone can drop in and out of that session. So the environment... One of the, Sorry, go on. I was going to say one of the advantages of the venue is that the actual conference space and the, and the room for the... Um, kind of talks is upstairs where downstairs we get the advantage that we can run the demo area and have a little bit of space for doing other things and keep that going all day so that there's something of interest for people most of the day so tell oh, us a, tell us yeah. a bit about the venue you said it's called mad lab yeah what um, sort of venue mad lab is, is it's a small venue in the northern quarter of manchester um it's popular with local groups such as linux user groups um maker groups, that sort of thing. And it provides the venue free of charge to us. We're not paying anything for the venue. Internet access, electricity, anything cool. at all. We're not paying it. They've given it to us gratis just so we can host the event there. Wow. And all we'll be doing on the day is asking for donations to the venue to keep it running. Ah, uh, cool. And the venue, it can change the needs of the group. Mm. So for UQ, it can have lots of internet connections everywhere, power sockets everywhere, and plenty of space. Or it can be an art gallery, or it can be a classroom for their omniversity, which they run every so often, which is um, like a, a micro uh, university course on how to do a specific task. I mean, at the moment, they're doing their courses on web design. So, who runs the venue then? It's run by a group of people who, uh, let's see, the main person I know of is uh, Huey Young. She's the main person there that I know, and Dave mm. as well. They run uh, the venue, and it's all run by donations and uh, yeah. grants and lottery grants, that sort of thing. Okay, so it's like a... They've got their own website, madlab.org.uk, if anyone wants to go and check it out. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. So it's like a community-run thing. There's, it's not backed yeah. by one big company somewhere or something. No. No, not at all. So what sort of things happened at last year's UQ? What sort of talks can people expect if they come this year, bearing in mind that it's an unconference and anybody can do what they like? Well, last year we were qu quite uh, busy talk-wise. I mean, let's see. I'm on the website now. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've got uh, Mr. Dan Lynch, who we're probably aware of. He was doing his talk about unity in the community. Oh, uh, right. Um, um, not about pies. You've probably heard of that guy. <laughs> yeah. um, we're also lucky as well to have Anna Morris, and she was talking about the philosophy of software freedom. Now, Anna's come into, um, into free, free software relatively recently, probably about 18 months ago. And the talk she did last year, she'd only been doing free software about six months. And it was all about how, what free software is and what you can do with it. And it was the most engaging talk you could ever see. Oh, wow. cool. it, was, it was fantastic. There's videos on the ucubes.info website you can see from last year. And she really does pitch the free software side of things really well to people who know nothing about it. And it was a really popular session. Um, and the spin-off from that is now she has her own um, um, uh, event, which is called Flossy, and that's done with Paula Graham from Fossbox in London. Ah, yes. This is a women-only conference, isn't it? We mentioned this a few weeks ago. Yeah. Sometime in May. 
25th. That's right, yeah, in May. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Will will any of the talks be uh, either recorded audio or video, or will any of it be streamed or hangouts? Or you're planning to, you know, share it in some way for the people who can't get along? I'm hoping now that I've invited Dan Lynch, he's going to bring that lovely Zoom recorder of his. I may half inch it. Um, mine along as well. Um, probably won't be any video this year, just for the amount of equipment we need to carry. But there'll be audio that I'll have on the website as soon as possible. Right, and plenty of photos. Oh, plenty of photos, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So do you need people to help run the event? Are you on the scrounge for crew? No, we're okay crew-wise. We're, we're quite good, thank you very much. Um, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Tony was offering that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know a really good head of crew from another event I've been running. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I won't get that last pounder. Yeah. Whoa, dodgy. <laughs> um, we're all right for crew because of the size of the event. I mean, we're looking at between 50 and 100 people coming. So mm-hmm. crew-wise, we don't need a lot of people. How many um, rooms is it that, that you're covering? You said you've got a, like a split upstairs, downstairs. So is that two main rooms, basically? Yeah, and we've got the downstairs section, which is really for workshops. We're not going to be hosting any talks in there because it's, it's too busy, too noisy to do a talk yeah. in there. Right. We tried last year. People got distracted when people were walking through, looking at the board and banging computers, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> So it's just the upstairs. We'll have one track all day and we'll put it into 20 minute sessions. But people can have, if they want to do an hour session on programming in Python, they could put down that and go for it. It's really up to them. Or they could do a lovely breakout session in the workshop area downstairs and just grab a table and do some bug testing. That sort of thing. How are you going to. Completely free form. They can do what they want. We'll just give them the facilities to do it. How are you going to run the um, schedule? Is it going to be like blank, everyone fills it in, or are you going to have it. Um, if it's overfilled and then you have to vote for what you want to go and see, or how, how are you going to manage that? I think mainly it's just going to be first come, first serve. We'll probably have a few fixed points in the day of, where we'll have specific talks. Ah, so um, less um, just... conference then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we all can't afford these luxury venues in Liverpool, Popey. <laughs> <laughs> luxury, you say? <laughs> in Liverpool, you <laughs> say? Uh-huh. Moving on. No, we've got a small venue. We want people to have as much freedom as we can possibly give them, but we do have to have a few fixed points, mainly the start and the finish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. could be yeah. quite a free point. Yeah, get them to go home at the end. That's a good good plan, yeah. So where can people find out more if they want to come along to find out how to get to the venue or, or are there any accommodation issues or anything? And when is it? Well, the actual event's going to be on Saturday the 28th of April. Mm-hmm. It's at 10 a.m. at Mad Lab, which is in Edge Street, Manchester. Uh, if you go to the website, ucubed.info, you can see some uh, details about the event itself, where it is, some videos from last year's event, and also um, a, a brief blog about what happened last year with some photos. Ah, oh, cool. And you're using uh, Eventbrite, so people need to sign up um, ahead of time, and you've got a limited number of seats... As I look on the website, we've got 68 tickets left. Yeah, 68 tickets left. But it's always worth people making sure they can definitely get in by by booking one in advance, I'm sure. Definitely, yeah. Okay, cool. Last year, all the tickets went, and we had people coming on the day saying, can I come in? And we said, no, you can't come in. Wow. Uh, Yeah, it was that popular. Definitely worth it. That's (laughs) That's brilliant. So it's two and a half weeks away. Um, So... People have only got a little bit of time to get themselves sorted to get up there. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like it'll be well worth it. It will indeed, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely a brilliant day. Uh, and myself, as fairly new to open source and, you know, Linux and stuff, I'd get, I get as much out of it as uh, the participants who come along to learn learn about it themselves. That's brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. That's really good. Sounds really good. Dan Lynch saying... While I'm on the phone to you, can I be really Uh-oh. cheeky? Yeah, go on, then. <laughs> Sorry, we'll bleep, we'll bleep all of this out. Say hi to your mum. Hi to everyone. I'm also organising Bar Camp Blackpool this year. Oh, yes. Ah, yes. Which is a, a very popular event. I mean, last year we had 150 people turn up and yes. a very big venue at the Pleasure Beach, the Paradise Room. Go this on, year, I'm on the scrounge for sponsors. So oh. if there's anyone listening who wants to sponsor uh, an up-and-coming uh, northern technology event with 150-plus uh, Text savvy people if they can go to barcampblackpool.com and they use the contact form on there. So just drop me a line. 
and we can talk business. Cool. <laughs> give us um, give us some uh, details um, after we finish recording, and uh, we'll put that in the show notes. Put out a call for uh, sponsors as well. Excellent. Thank you. Well, so thank you very much indeed for coming along to talk to us, gents, and uh, best of luck with both events. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, you guys. See Cheers. Ya. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Time for the bit about Ubuntu. And uh, we've just had the new wallpapers for the upcoming 1204 LTS release uh, updated and delivered into the repository. Ooh, mm. These are community sourced wallpapers, aren't they? Yes, except, well, one of them, the default one isn't, is the, um, what do they call it, fruit salad or something? The, the purple and orange one um, <laughs> is blodges. was designed by Otto Greenslade, I think. Um, but yes, there's a load of other ones flowers, animals. Um, the side of a boat, uh, more flowers, a wheel, a light, some sky, you know, <laughs> typical kind of stuff you'd get on a desktop background, really, you know, good. Mm. quite nice, pretty. Yes, and a nice opportunity for the community to contribute. Yes. Brilliant. Uh, the Ubuntu Technical Board have said that they would not object to Ubuntu being sponsored by a new commercial entity, which is very fortunate given the interview uh, <laughs> we've just had, <laughs> in which we revealed that it had been sponsored, sponsored by, by a new commercial, commercial entity. entity. Yes. Yeah. That's good, isn't it? That is good, yeah. Cool. Well done. George Castro has written a guide to contributing the documentation for Juju. Alan, what's Juju? <laughs> it's it's it you'll have to go to the website to find out. I did. <laughs> and I looked at it and I saw the words and I was still confused. It's like deploying applications in the cloud. So you know on your desktop you do apt get install yeah. um Firefox or something, and it yes. pulls all the de the dependencies in and puts the application down. Well, imagine you have lots of servers and you want to deploy some web application across all those servers. Maybe you've got a um, a farm of web servers and you want to put Apache on all of them and have them all configured to talk to WordPress and you want WordPress to talk to MySQL and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So the developers set up these things called charms, and when you use Juju to install a charm, you could do an, an install of a charm that is just called WordPress and it will go and get all the other stuff and you know and link it all together and make it a lot easier so you don't have to go in and configure files and so go if, through web admin tools and stuff like that. So if you're deploying onto Amazon S3 or something like that, you can... Use EC2, that. Or, EC2 or your sorry, own yeah. private cloud or... Own private yep. cloud. <laughs> yep. Or even on... Yeah. <laughs> okay. and, and so it, the documentation has been lacking because it's been developed at a fairly rapid rate. Yeah. Um, so uh, George put out the call to get uh, uh, some people to help... So document it. If people are interested in documenting it, we'll put a link in the show notes and you mm -hmm. can find out more about how to get involved. Yeah, we should get George on to talk about uh, Juju. We should do. Because it is one of those... Explain what it is. Yeah, it's one of the... Yeah, it explains better than I do. Yeah. I didn't want to say that. But, yeah, thanks. You know. <laughs> Michael Hall has published a blog post entitled Distribution is Contribution, arguing that Ubuntu's inclusion of software in its repositories and especially in the default install is a valuable contribution to those upstream projects. Yeah, I think this was um, partly in response to a lot of um, the usual <laughs> stuff that comes out where... How many lines says, of code has Ubuntu exactly. contributed to the Linux kernel? Yeah, precisely how much does Ubuntu contribute? So they're saying just by actually having a package in its repositories, it's putting more eyes on it, it's improving the quality of the software because people are finding bugs in it and those bugs can then be fixed. And people are using it. Yeah, and people are using it. Yeah, I mean, some okay. some people would say that if you create a piece of code, it's for your own, it's, you're scratching an itch and you're doing it for yourself. Yeah. But, you know, an entity like Firefox, uh, like Mozilla Foundation, want to make the web better by creating software. And the only way they can make that, that um, the web better is by getting people to use that software. And so having Firefox shipped on the desktop of Ubuntu is, you know, good to help them reach their goals. Yeah, so. okay. Yes. Uh, all known bugs in the 10.04 <laughs> LTS to 12... Uh, point oh four LTS upgrade process have been fixed. Alan's tittering a, in the background. No, it's just whatever I see. All bugs fixed. I said but, all known bugs. Yes. I was very careful in the wording. <laughs> well done. So this means we should be able to upgrade from 10.04 to 12.04, LTS to LTS. Absolutely problem free. <laughs> Guaranteed. In theory. So in the past, I you know, people have always um, said that upgrades in Ubuntu and Debian and you know, other distros don't work, and so people go about reinstalling stuff. And I and I I'm pretty keen on upgrading, and I upgrade all my machines, and I try to do upgrades because mm. if you don't do them, 
then and don't find the bugs then those bugs never get fixed and so it becomes like yeah i like your theory well, if everyone ignored upgrades and everyone just does clean installs, nobody's testing the upgrades and so nobody can ever get them fixed because nobody knows what the bugs are. Yes, it's, I suppose it's not good to ex- experience a bug and then complain about it but not actually file it on Launchpad. Which is what a lot of people do. Yes. Why are you the, looking the, the at trouble, me? The trouble really with upgrading is if you upgrade your machine and then it breaks, you don't have a machine to file a bug from. <laughs> Uh, people yeah, have more really than one not in the mood to file a bug because you've now yeah, to reinstall true. your machine because yeah. it's just broken. Yeah, some people get really frustrated and they just go, oh, I'll screw this, I'll get an, inst- uh, an ISO image and, and reinstall it or I'll use whatever and CD I have then, previously. Yeah, if, if the bug got fixed five minutes later, that's five minutes too late. So one thing that Canonical are doing is running um, tests on upgrading uh, virtual machines from 10.04 to 12.04 mm-hmm. um, and doing it not just with a clean install but with loads of packages installed because that's the thing that we you yeah. know we need yeah. to yeah. test is what real world you know users are likely to have mix, mix and match of, of all kinds of different packages and that's what um app the, get install star <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was gonna say asterisk but of course that would install Asterisk. <laughs> oh, the math. Oh, he's so funny. Isn't he? Well, I always upgrade, so I always appreciate it when people have fixed the upgrade process. I was trying to work out when I first installed my desktop PC with Ubuntu. It was about seven years ago, and it's the same installation being upgraded, upgraded and upgraded. Really? Yeah. See, people keep telling me it never works. I mean, it's it always been, works. <laughs> been loads of bugs and I had to, <laughs> well, yeah, I had to sure. fix them all along the way, but that's what software development's about. Yeah. I always wait a bit. I never do it immediately. So, yeah. But it usually works at that point. Now. <laughs> and finally so long and thanks for all the meerkats ubuntu 10 10 goes out of support today today yes Aww. april the 10th it was six months ago on the 10th no 18 six months, months ago. ago on the 10th of the 10th of the 10th and that's the maverick yes maverick and meerkat and it ends support desktop and server uh yeah, yes it's because it's not an lts so it ends no. on the same day excellent so you need to upgrade to a supported release yes upgrade to natty and then and and eric and then Precise. Precise. <laughs> Precisely. Yes. Or do a clean install if you don't like upgrades. <laughs> See if I care. At that point, it's probably worth doing a clean install. <laughs> it's only 18 months old. Do you know, I actually found a, I found a laptop in, in, in a drawer that had, it was an old HP thing, Celeron thing. And I think it was running 1010. And I went through the upgrades. I just sat there leaving it in the, on, on my desk, like running while I was working. And every so often it would pop up a dialogue and I'd just go, okay. And, and I upgraded it all the way through to precise. I think I found a VM running feisty uh, <laughs> about three months ago. And then deleted it? Uh, no, I booted off a ISO. Right. Just to test that. There we go. And finally, in our not about Ubuntu... A post on Babbage, the Economist's science and technology blog, has slated the ecosystem surrounding desktop Linux, while an article on PC World has trumped it up. Okay. Trumped it. Trumped it. Trumped it, it, yeah. trumped trumped it up. up. Trumped it up. It's just made it up. Um, yes. Okay, what were their reasons for criticising the ecosystem <laughs> it on was the a, Babbage blog? It was a bit weird. It was saying that... Um, it was saying, basically, that uh, they didn't like all the... Well... Hmm. Yeah, the main reason was that it, there were lots of packages and things, so it's not as as tightly constrained in what gets shipped as Apple and Microsoft right. and things. Um, but the way it was expressed sounded like, oh, there's all these choices. And then a few minutes later said that uh, Ubuntu has chosen to go with just Unity and maybe a bit of GNOME. Um, and that's it. And that's what's really annoying all the users. And I was like, well, you can't have it both ways. And I don't think no. that's quite what he meant, but... Mm. But it then, was a little bit incoherent. Yeah, it was a little it was. bit. And then the PCWorld.com one was a really in praise of Linux and everything, which was great. But it was all about people absolutely loving choice. But that's not going to help either if you've just got all these options and you just want to use it. Mm. So they wouldn't, I didn't really agree with either of them. Good. Glad we put that in there. <laughs> that's all in the bit about them and not about them too.
And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. And you can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including our voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Let us know what you think of the show. Give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. And join us again on Wednesday, the 25th of April for our next live episode. Note that's not our usual day. Yes. It's the, a day it's, later. It's also the day before uh, Precise comes out. Yes. So that's why we're doing it that day. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so we're going to release and I'm going to do a silly blog post that says it's out and put out the podcast on the, on the release day. I'll just warn you of that now because I know people the get efforts, annoyed when I do that. The efforts we go to for these jokes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Excellent. So join us on Wednesday the 25th and then uh, we'll have a good episode. <laughs> <laughs> I might even be awake. Right. Um, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.